Okay, let's start chapter 21 on superposition. And here is a picture of an oil slick on water. This is a beautiful effect caused by superposition. So we'll start by actually considering two uh, particles, like baseballs, flying through space. Here is baseball A, which is launched down to the right, and baseball B is launched down to the left. When the balls get to the same position at the same time, they can't coexist, and so what they do is they bounce off one another. So they, they interact right here and, and, uh, and collide. It's a particle collision. But what about two waves? If we have speaker A sh shooting a sound wave uh, down to the right and speaker B shooting a sound wave down to the left, when they, those two sounds exist at the same uh, point in space, at the same time, what happens? Well, it turns out these waves go right through each other and they obey what we call the principle of superposition. And that is that if wave one displaces a particle in the medium by d1 and wave two simultaneously displaces it by d2, the net displacement of the particle in the medium is d1 plus d2. So when one or two or more waves are simultaneously present at a single point in space, the displacement of the medium at that point is the sum of the displacements due to each individual wave. So it's pretty simple. Here we have a little triangle wave moving from left to right, which encounters a rectangular wave moving from right to left. This is t equals zero seconds. When you get to t equals two seconds, they coexist. And the principle of superposition says that you just do the sum of the individual waves to find the displacement. The solid line is the displacement at that point. So this would be the wave at t equals two, the wave at t equals three. The dashed lines are showing you the individual components, but the solid line is showing you what the, what the string actually does. And then after a time t equals four, we see the triangle wave is moving without having changed at all, still from left to right, and the rectangle hasn't changed at all and is moving from right to left. Standing wave. So here is a standing wave uh, on a string. And you may not be able to see, or it may not be obvious from this animation, but this is actually a superposition of two waves. And to understand this, I want you to consider two sinusoidal waves with the same frequency, same wavelength, and same amplitude that are traveling in opposite directions, one left to right, one right, right to left. Well, here's an animation showing what that looks like. This light gray wave is sinusoidal, traveling from left to right, and the darker gray is traveling from right to left. If you do the superposition or the sum of these two waves, you get this blue line shown below, and that's a standing wave. And standing waves are characterized by points where nothing moves, that's called a node, and points where it moves at its maximum amplitude, that's called an anti-node. And here, this figure is collapsed several graphs at different instants of time to sort of show on a piece of paper without an animation a standing wave. Here's the nodes where things don't move, and here are the antinodes where it's going up and down. Okay. So the nodes are spaced each uh, half a wavelength apart, and halfway between the nodes are the antinodes where the particles in the medium oscillate with their maximum displacement. Now in chapter 20, you learned that the intensity of a wave is proportional to the square of the amplitude. Uh, so, intensity of a standing wave is zero at the nodes, but then it goes up to, since the antinodes are two times the amplitude of the individual waves, the intensity is actually four times the intensity of the individual waves uh, at the antinodes. And here is actually in real life showing a standing wave. They, they, they show up a lot. Uh, here's a bridge uh, just before it collapsed uh, long ago, uh, the 1940s, I believe. The Tacoma Narrow, uh, Tacoma Narrows Suspension Bridge did collapse, and it was oscillating due to aerodynamic forces coming from uh, gusts of wind blowing past the bridge. And the red line shows, I guess, the equilibrium position of the bridge. And then there was this standing wave uh, with a node in the middle and two anti-nodes uh, between the, the two piers where it's being suspended. And uh, you can see it going down and up, and then it would go down on 
this side and up on this side. So a sinusoidal wave traveling to the right is given by d equals a sine kx minus omega t. And an equivalent wave, same amplitude, traveling towards the left is a sine kx plus omega t. Now notice that usually, or we used to use capital A for the amplitude. Now I want to use lowercase a to represent the amplitude for each of these two individual waves that we're going to add. When we add them, it's just, here's the sum, a sine kx minus omega t plus a kx uh, plus omega t. We can simplify this by using a trigonometric identity, which I might do in class, and you get it's a some function of x times cos omega t, where the amplitude function a of x is defined as 2a sine kx. So you've got uh, oscillations, uh, like a looks like simple harmonic motion, and then the, the amplitude depends on position, and that's a standing wave. So this amplitude reaches a maximum in any places where sine kx equals 1. And here's what it looks like. This is the, shown the graph of dx of t, uh, d of x and t at several instants of time, showing it going up and down at the antinodes and not moving at all at the nodes. And here's the equations which describe it. The nodes occur at positions uh, that are some integer multiple of lambda over 2. So waves on a string with a discontinuity. Okay, So a string with a large linear density is connected to one with a smaller linear density. And the tension is kept same in both strings. So if you send a pulse, wave pulse, along the heavier string, it moves slowly uh, in the heavier string. And then when it hits the lighter string, it speeds up. But whenever a wave encounters such a, a discontinuity or change in speed, some of the wave's energy is actually reflected backwards. And that's also true if you start with a lighter string and then go to a heavier string. So here the speed decreases and there is also some energy reflected but now the reflected pulse is inverted. And when we have an uh, inverted wave we say that there's a phase change upon reflection of pi. So it's half of 2 pi, right? If you have a wave on a string that reflects a reflects from a hard boundary, you get uh, whoop, sorry, you get an inverted wave, but it has the same amplitude. So here is a picture of this happening on a spring, and here's a nice little animation. Pulse comes along, hits the hits the boundary, and then reflects backwards and is inverted. So here we have uh, a string that's supported by two fixed walls, and we wiggle the string in the middle. This sends out pulses towards the right and pulses towards the left, which reflect off the walls. And these reflected waves have equal amplitude and, and wavelength, but they're traveling in opposite directions to the original waves. And that's exactly the conditions to cause a standing wave. You've got two sinusoidal waves traveling in opposite directions. And so that is what happens. For a string of fixed length L, boundary conditions are, uh, are such that the wavelength of standing waves is 2L over M, where M is some integer. So if you have a sinusoidal wave with any of these wavelengths, then it can, uh, it can make a standing wave on this string. And this corresponds to frequencies, since lambda times f is v, where v is the speed of uh, waves in the string, you can solve for the frequencies of standing waves as being uh, m times v over 2l. So the lowest allowed frequency is when m equals 1. That's just uh, called the fundamental frequency, v over 2l. And shown here are various standing waves uh, for a string of uh, fixed length l. Here is m equals 1, uh, sometimes called the fundamental mode. And here are the other modes. This is the m equals 2 mode, or the first, uh, second harmonic Third harmonic is the m equals 3 mode. Each mode is numbered uh, numbered by an integer m. There's also an m equals 4 mode shown here. And here are the wavelengths and the frequencies of all these different modes. 
It turns out that m, that integer, is the number of anti-nodes on the standing wave on the string. So the fundamental mode has one anti-node in the middle, uh, and its wavelength is just 2L. And the frequencies of the normal modes form a series. Uh, they're, they're all integer multiples of F1, where F1 is the fundamental frequency. So whenever you have a series of frequencies that you know are, are, uh, are standing waves, the difference between any two adjacent modes is this fundamental frequency. Here's the m equals 3 mode on a, uh, on a string, shown in that uh, time exposure photograph. You can also have standing, mo standing waves in light, and that is actually what a laser is. So standing electromagnetic waves can be established if you have two mirrors. So you have some light going back and forth, and uh, these are both sinusoidal waves, and you create a little standing wave in, inside there. And if you have one of those beams being, a, or one of these mirrors being a partial reflector, you can get some of the light leaking out, and that's what forms a laser beam. So a typical laser cavity has a length of about 30 centimeters, and visible light has a wavelength of 600 nanometers, which is far less, or it's about a half of a micron, or a half of a thousandth of a millimeter. So a standing light wave in a laser cavity typically has mode numbers up around a million. So you can see there's lots and lots of about a million antinodes inside this uh, laser cavity. So a long, narrow column of air such as the air in a, in a pipe or a flute, can support a standing sound wave. A closed end of a column of air must be a displacement node. That means that the particles can't move back and forth very much if there's a boundary there, or a closed end. Now, it's often useful to think of sound as a pressure wave rather than a displacement wave. The pressure oscillates around its equilibrium value. And the nodes and antinodes of the pressure wave are interchanged with those of a displacement wave when you have a standing sound wave. Let's see how that works. So here's a little an animation that I'll put a link to on the website showing uh, very simply a sinusoidal wave, uh, longitudinal wave, traveling through some air. And uh, what is plotted in this top graph is the displacement from equilibrium of uh, each air molecule. So it's definitely a sine wave, as you can see here. And let's just pause it. When particle 1 is at equilibrium, it sits on this little line 1. And then these equilibrium positions are equally spaced, uh, because if there's no sound wave, then you've got a, a ambient density which uh, doesn't vary with time. And then, as you step through this, uh, when you're below equilibrium, it actually means that the particles are to the left of their equilibrium position. And then when you go uh, up above equilibrium, that means that the particles are to the right of their equilibrium. And what you can see from the actual uh, lineup of, of air molecules is that at the positions where uh, the molecules themselves are at equilibrium, you either get uh, a maximum density, like at 0.3 here, or a minimum density, like at 0.9 here. And if we step along, uh, here now 0.5 is at equilibrium, that's a maximum density, and we'll have a rarefaction coming along at 0 0.1, at 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and now 0 0.5 is actually a, a rarefaction or a minimum in density. And so you can see that the density or the pressure is, uh, is out of phase with the distance from equilibrium of the particles by a quarter of a wavelength. So it follows along a quarter of the wavelength behind this, uh, this sine wave is the, would be the pressure sine wave. Okay, so here we see a snapshot of a standing wave in a closed, closed uh, tube of air, and the closed ends force a displacement node, but a pressure anti-node. And the air molecules undergo these longitudinal oscillations, because they're sound waves. And so here we have a, 
we're plotting delta x, the displacement of these waves versus distance. You get an antinode here, you get a node at the end, and uh, force nodes at both ends, and there happens to be a node at the center as well, because this is the m equals 2 uh, standing wave. So that's delta x. If you look at the pressure, you'll see that the displacement and pressure nodes are antinodes and nodes are interchanged. So an antinode of displacement is a node of pressure. So the ends of a closed tube have forced pressure antinodes. So here is a standing sound wave in a closed closed tube. You can see the red lines are showing the standing wave for pressure, and the blue lines are showing the standing wave for displacement. The M equals 1 mode looks like this, M equals 2 mode looks like uh, looks like this, and the M equals 3 mode looks like this. And in each of these cases, the frequency is some integer, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, times V over 2L, where V is the speed of sound. That's a closed, closed tube. If you have an open, open tube, it's the exact same equations, integer 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc., times V over 2L. But now it just looks a little different. Here's the, uh, the pressure now is uh, forced to have nodes at the end of an open, open tube, where the displacement has an anti-node at the ends. And that's the M equals 1, M equals 2, M equals 3. Uh, you get different frequencies if you have one end closed and the other end open. So here at the closed end, you force uh, a displacement node or a pressure anti-node. At the open end, you force a pressure node or a displacement uh, anti-node. And so the M equals 1 looks like this, where the length is actually a quarter of the wavelength. And the M equals 3, and you see it's three quarters of a wavelength. So uh, the frequencies end up being only odd integer multiples of V over 4L. So in stringed instruments, like the harp or the piano, the ends are fixed, and they create some tension. And a disturbance is generated by plucking the string to create a standing wave. And the fundamental frequency on a stringed instrument is V over 2L, where V is this square root of the tension divided by mu. Okay. So uh, that's the speed of the waves on the string. And here's the length of the string. So you can vary the tension, you can vary the string uh, density, or you can vary the length of the string. All of these will create different notes or different frequencies. In a wind instrument, you blow over the mouthpiece, and that creates a standing wave inside the tube of air. And you can change the notes on a wind instrument by uh, using your fingers to cover holes or open valves, effectively changing the length of the tube. So V here is the speed of sound in whatever, uh, I guess, the air inside the tube, and L is the length. So if there's an open, open tube, such as a flute, open at both ends, the frequencies are V over 2L. And for an open, closed tube, like a, a clarinet, the frequency, the fundamental frequency is V over 4L. Uh, and if you overblow these instruments, you can produce higher harmonics, such as F2, which is available for a, a flute, you can double it, or F3, uh, such as uh, for a clarinet, you can triple uh, the, the fundamental frequency, it would be uh, your first harmonic there for a clarinet. Uh, 